from California, Mr. Dreyer, is recognized for 60 minutes as the designee of the majority leader. The gentleman from California is recognized for 60 minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I ask uh, unanimous consent to revise and extend my remarks. No objection. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, uh, I, uh, I rise today to talk about an issue that uh, both Democrats and Republicans and virtually every American is talking about and people all over the world are talking about. What is that issue? How do we increase global economic growth? And here in this country, how do we create more good American jobs? It's obviously a key part of the presidential campaign. We have uh, Democrats and Republicans daily stand in the well of the House of Representatives and offer proposals, talk about their ideas as to how we can create good jobs. We have the sad report of 380,000 people who fell off the uh, rolls even looking for jobs. We have literally millions of our fellow Americans who are looking for jobs, and we have many businesses that are struggling. One of the great challenges that President Obama put forward was the goal of doubling our exports. And we all know that he very much wanted to do that. We, as uh, members of Congress, came together after a decade, and we finally were able to successfully pass market-opening opportunities for U.S. workers to sell their goods and provide our services in Panama, Colombia, and South Korea. It took us a long time to get there. I know that um, it's easy to point the finger of blame, but the fact is um, we've been ready for a long time. This institution was ready for a long time, Democrats and Republicans alike, and we were finally able to get the legislation up here from down on Pennsylvania Avenue, and we were able to make it happen with strong bipartisan votes on all three of those agreements. Well, Mr. Speaker, with recognition that opening up markets around the world for U.S. goods and services is a key way to create jobs here, because again, as we debated the Panama, Colombia, and Korea trade agreements, there were members on both sides of the aisle who stood up and argued in behalf of those agreements, we now have before us what I believe is an absolute no-brainer, but tragically it's created some political consternation over a, a lot of confusion. We know that um, the idea of seeing countries join the WTO, the World Trade Organization, uh, creates a scenario whereby they have to comply with a rules-based trading system. And we know that um, once they enter the WTO, there are constraints imposed on them, uh, along with the benefits that they get for their membership in the WTO. And there was a lot of negotiation, a lot of talk about Russia's entry into the World Trade Organization. The idea of seeing Russia forced to comply with a system that would prevent them from engaging in discriminatory practices, from engaging in the kinds of acts that prevent, prevent products and services from getting into their country. Uh, the structure of having to comply with a rules-based system is something that membership in the WTO uh, forces and, and creates. And um, again, there were a lot of negotiations. The last was dealing with a border dispute with Georgia that was resolved, and that was resolved several months ago, and that put into place a structure that allowed on August 22nd, last month, for Russia to enter the World Trade Organization. Russia is part of the WTO. They are now, having been for over three weeks, a member of the World Trade Organization. That means, as I said, tremendous benefits that Russia gets. They have 140 million consumers, and there are going to be opportunities for countries around the world to export into Russia. We last year exported $11 billion, $11 billion of goods and services into the WTO. But guess what, Mr. Speaker? We're not at the table anymore. We've lost out on our chance to be able to sell our goods and services into Russia, that market of 140 million consumers. Now, why is it that we've lost out? Well, 
We haven't been able to have a vote here in the Congress on Russia, Russia's accession to the WTO. Why hasn't that happened? Well, I hate to be political, even though this is the time of year when people are especially political, but we need to get this sent up here to the Congress so that we can put together what I know is going to be very broad bipartisan support to make this happen. When it comes up, I know that we will see tremendous support on the Republican side of the aisle. And I say that because I'm particularly proud of the 73 newly elected Republican members of Congress, newly elected Republican members of Congress. Of the 87, 73 sent a letter to President Obama saying that they believed it very important for us to open up that market so that if we all have this desire of creating more good jobs in the United States, let's open up that market to 140 million consumers. Well, unfortunately, we're still waiting for that. And I know, I know that it's not just Republicans who are in support of this, Mr. Speaker. We have Democrats who are passionately and strongly in support of it. My very dear friend from New York, Mr. Meeks, is he's going to join us. We've got uh, other uh, colleagues of ours who are going to join us in just a minute. But I, I want to say that this is something that absolutely should be done. Now, I talked about the fact that I believe it's a no-brainer, but I recognize that there is a lot of political consternation about this because it's Russia. And we all know that Russia has an absolutely horrendous human rights policy. We know that Russia has engaged in trying to expand its sphere, its sphere to uh, other former republics of the Soviet Union. Uh, we know that there is tremendous corruption and cronyism that exists in Russia today, and it is not acceptable. It is not acceptable to any of us. Now, there are some, Mr. Speaker, who argue that for us to um, deny the U.S. an opportunity to have a vote on PNTR, basically repealing Jackson Vanek and allowing us to proceed this, with this would be um, a good thing, and it would send a message to Russia, when in fact the exact opposite is the case. There is nothing that we could do as the United States of America that would be a greater boost to supporting the perpetuation of the aberrant behavior that we have seen from Russia than for us to deny a vote on permanent normal trade relations that would, uh, would see us then have access to that market. I said that last year we exported $11 billion of goods and services to Russia. If we could pass PNTR here, projections are that by 2017, we would double that from $11 billion to $22 billion. Now, what does that mean? It means more good U.S. jobs. And what does it mean? It means an expansion of our American values. It means, again, this forced compliance with a rules-based trading system. It means creating a structure that will allow us to undermine the kind of political repression that exists in Russia. Now, our sticking our head in the sand would be just plain wrong. Now, those are not just my words, Mr. Speaker. We, uh, on the 12th of March, received a letter from seven of the most prominent and outspoken human rights activists in Russia. And they, in a letter, an open letter that was sent to those of us who are considering this issue, said the following. Now, this is from these, these very, very prominent dissidents and activists, some of whom I'm sure have been imprisoned. They've had uh, long histories of being opposition leaders to Vladimir Putin. So in the letter that they sent to us, Mr. Speaker, they said, some politicians in the United States argue that the removal of Russia from Jackson Vanek would help no one but the current Russian undemocratic political regime. They go on to say, that assumption is flat wrong. Although there are obvious problems with democracy and human rights in modern Russia, the persistence on the books of the Jackson Vanek Amendment does not help to resolve, to, to solve them at all. Moreover, it brings direct harm. It limits Russia's competitiveness in international markets for higher value added products, leaving Russia trapped in its current petro state model of development 
and preventing it from transforming into a modern, diversified, and more high-tech economy. This helps Mr. Putin and his cronies, they say in this letter. At the end of the day, those who defend the argument that Jackson Vanek's provisions should still apply to Russia in order to punish Putin's anti-democratic regime only darken Russia's political future, hamper its economic development, and frustrate its democratic aspirations. And, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to ask unanimous consent to include this letter from the seven dissidents in the uh, record in its entirety, underscoring how critically important it is for us to take this action so that we can boost those who are struggling to improve the plight of those Russians who are uh, seeing their human rights jeopardized based on the current policies. And I'd like to ask unanimous consent that it be included in the record, if I might, Mr. Speaker. No objection. I also want to say that as we look at this question of job creation and economic growth, it's not something that, again, is at all partisan. And it's something that transcends this institution. We have uh, received um, a new number of letters. And let me see if I can dig this one up here. We have um, a bipartisan letter from governors across this country that was sent uh, just weeks ago, on the 25th of July. It was uh, sent to us by governors from Alabama, Arkansas, California, Connecticut, Delaware, Georgia, Iowa, Michigan, Mississippi, North Dakota, South Carolina, South Dakota, Utah, Vermont, and Washington. A broad cross-section geographically and politically, Democrats and Republicans. And all of these governors were signatories to this letter in which they say, as governors, we know from firsthand experience in our states that expanding opportunities for international trade and attracting foreign investment are essential to promoting U.S. economic growth and creating new and better jobs right here in America. Russia's impending membership of the World Trade Organization offers a significant opportunity to increase our trade and investment with the world's ninth largest economy. And so I've got to say, Mr. Speaker, you can understand why I see this as a no-brainer. To me, this is a, a pretty simple thing. But I recognize that some might believe that it's a reward to Russia and to Vladimir Putin. And I stand with them. I stand with them for all the reasons that they're opposing it. But I argue that the reasons that they and I oppose the... Uh, actions of Vladimir Putin underscore why we need to ensure that the U.S. is at the table. And so, with the President having stated that he has this goal of doubling U.S. exports, and we've got 140 million consumers there who very much want to have access to U.S. manufactured products, to our goods and services, we need to get it done. And why don't I uh, begin, since I see a number of my colleagues here, by recognizing my very good friend, from uh, New York, Mr. Meeks, who uh, has joined us. And as I recognize Mr. Meeks, I'd like to say that a number of members have come up to me from both sides of the aisle, Mr. Speaker, and indicated that they uh, very much wanted to be able to be here this evening to talk about this. One of them is our friend from uh, Virginia, Mr. Moran, and he handed me some talking points as his statement that at this juncture I would like to ask unanimous consent be included in the record as well. And with that, I'd like to uh, yield uh, time to my uh, very, very good friend from uh, New York, Mr. Meeks.